Acts chapter 12. I'm going to draw your attention, beginning in verse 1, and I'm going to do my best to go through this. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. We're getting close to wrapping this up, but I want to consider for a little bit just the God of the impossible. This is the God we serve. Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. And now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Shall we pray? Father, we do ask now, just as we uh, look at your word, Father, that you would impart something to us from heaven, that you would speak to us, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've read through the book of Acts, you know that it was in Acts chapters 10 and 11 where the Apostle Peter had the unique privilege of being the first person to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. He'd been welcomed into the home of a Roman centurion, and Peter began to share how Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world and how he rose again from the dead on the third day and offered salvation to all who would turn to him from their sin. And the soldier and his entire family came to faith in Christ. And it was following that encounter that the floodgates opened and the gospel continued to spread among the Gentiles. However, this plunged the church into another wave of persecution. King Herod united both the political and the religious parties in harassing the church and ordering the death of the Apostle James. Now, when reading through the New Testament, you do discover that there are at least five men who are mentioned with the name Herod, and each one of them was part of the Herodian dynasty. This particular Herod, Herod Agrippa I, was the grandson of Herod the Great who was the king when Jesus was born, who had ordered the death of the children there in Bethlehem. And much like his forefathers, Herod Agrippa I was a very evil man. In fact, history tells us that he grew up being educated in Rome, and he had endured, uh, really endeared himself rather, to one of the future Roman emperors whose name was Caligula. And when Caligula came to power, he made Agrippa first the king of Syria, then Galilee and Perea, and later on he was also given the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now in order to secure his political position, Agrippa sought to connect himself with the religious Jews. And so he practiced the Jewish religion. He offered daily sacrifices in the temple, and he even read the law of Moses publicly. Herod was well aware of the religious leaders' frustrations with the church and the growing ministry of the apostles. Therefore, he arrested James and then put him to death, murdered him by the sword. This particular James was James, the brother of John. James, Peter, and John, these guys were part of the inner three disciples that followed Jesus. Remember, during his earthly ministry, Jesus told James that there would come a day when he would drink the same cup of sacrifice and be baptized with the baptism that Jesus was baptized with. Jesus, of course, was referring to James's death, and that word of Jesus had come to be fulfilled in James' life. There's no mention of a trial, only a martyrdom by the sword. James had laid his life down for the cause of Christ, but one death wasn't enough for this evil king. And so he sought to put Peter to death as well. Because of the fact that James' death had brought such a favorable response from the Jewish leaders, he decided to incarcerate Peter. And Peter was arrested during the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was also combined with the Passover to commemorate the exodus of the Jewish people out of their slavery in Egypt. And it was Herod's intention that at the end of that celebration to put Peter to death. Now you may recall that this was not the first time that Peter had been in prison. Peter had already done some time for his bold witness back in Acts chapter 4. He healed a lame man and he was arrested. Then again in Acts chapter 5, he and the other apostles 
hadn't heeded the warning of the authorities, but kept on preaching the gospel. And a second time, he was arrested. However, on that occasion, there was an angelic jailbreak that took place. Herod, knowing about Peter's previous time in jail, decided to take extra precaution and had Peter guarded by four squads of soldiers, meaning that one of the four squads would rotate shifts watching him through the night. Peter was also chained between two soldiers with the, in the cell, and the other two stood guard outside of the cell to ensure that there was no way that Peter would ever escape. It was at this point that everything looks impossible for Peter. The one-time outspoken leader of the church had been sentenced to death. James has been killed, and now it was a matter of time before Peter would join him in death. Everything seemed hopeless. Everything seemed impossible. Folks, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the word impossible is defined as something that cannot be done. You probably knew that. It labels something as being completely, it's out of the question. But when you define something as impossible, you have to always measure the impossibility by the agent that's doing the work. There are certain things from a human perspective that are impossible for us. We have limitations. But when you talk about God, who spoke the universe into existence, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain, who spans the universe with his hand, when he's the agent doing the work, impossibility then becomes absurdity. The, oh, impossible is not in God's vocabulary. Amen? Do you know that? In the midst of the government harassing the church, Peter being in prison for his faith, something powerful was taking place outside of the prison walls, and that was this, the church was praying. In verse 5, we find the intercession of the church. Peter was kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. The church didn't have any other options. It wasn't like they could petition the king or they could post bail. They didn't have a defense attorney, or an amendment to claim. All that the church could do was petition heaven. All that they could do was cry out to God. But prayer, prayer makes all the difference. Prayers were offered up to God. And not just any kind of prayer, but constant prayer. The word used here for constant is the Greek word for earnest. It means to stretch, to strain. The church was straining in prayer, agonizing really in fervent prayer. It was earnest. It was heartfelt. They were in agony as they prayed. The Bible again says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Even though the gates of Herod's dungeon were closed, the gates of heaven were wide open. And the prayers of the saints filled heavens. The church fell to its knees and with a ceaseless volume of prayer ascended before the throne of grace. Friends, I, I believe this is what the church needs to be doing right now. We need to be praying. Do we pray as a church? You know, at our fellowship, we, we have a prayer meeting every week. We have a prayer meeting on Tuesday mornings where I gather with a group of men for one hour and we just intercede. Uh, the women pray on Wednesday morning, a women's prayer meeting that lasts actually three hours. They have more time than we do, but they, they pray for three hours. And then when people need prayer or healing, they, people are allowed to come through at the end of that and be prayed over. And we've seen some amazing things. We also have prayer for missionaries that happens on Wednesday night. And so there, there is a, and every Wednesday night after the service, we conclude. When the service concludes, I have everybody stand. I have them circle up with one another in their groups and I have them pray for 10 minutes. And we just pray, either pray in the message or pray as the Holy Spirit directs us. And it's been powerful. A church that prays is a church that's effective. And so we want to continue to seek the Lord in prayer. And if you find yourself in an impossible situation, maybe you sought the Lord, the question is, have you prayed? Have you prayed? Sometimes when we face something that's impossible, what do we do? We strategize. Or we think about, oh, I gotta find a solution. And we forget to pray. It's almost like we did everything we could do. You know, we, we should pray. You know, it's a good idea. Why don't we pray? Yeah, I mean, we've tried everything else. You know, <laughs> why don't we start with prayer? Prayer should be the first resort. This is the first thing we turn to, not the last option. Pray immediately. It was A.W. Pink that said, prayer is not designed for the furnishing of God with 
the knowledge of what we need, but it is designed as a confession to him of our sense of need. The highest purpose of prayer, to see God's will accomplished. The Bible exhorts us to prayer. I love what, I love what Jim Elliott said, that missionary who was martyred for his own faith. He said, God is still on the throne, and we are still on his footstool, and there is only a knee's distance between us. Oh, folks, we need, to, we need to pray. As constant prayers of the church were being offered up, it resulted in some amazing thing. First of all, it provided peace. It provided peace. For we read in, in verses 6 and 7, when Herod was about to bring Peter out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound be, with two chains between two soldiers, and guards before the door were keeping the prison. Peter was sleeping. This is the night before he's going to die, before he's to be executed. Peter's not pacing. He's not wide awake thinking, I'm going to die tomorrow. He's sleeping. There is, there is a sense of peace. And we're going to find out he was in a deep sleep. I mean, this guy, was, he was in a deep sleep. He had to be slapped by an angel, as it were, to, to wake up shaken, as it were. He was sleeping so wonderfully. It reminds me of what Jesus said in John chapter 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The prayers that were being offered up provided Peter with a peace that he desperately needed. Folks, have you noticed that when you pray and you bring God into the circumstances that God can bring peace even in the most tumultuous of times? And you wonder why, people look at you and they think, why are you at peace? You should be stressed. You should be anxious. You should be pacing. Why aren't you worried? I don't know. I, I don't, I have peace. I have a peace that surpasses my understanding. It is guarding my heart and mind through Jesus Christ. I've let my request be made known to him and he is protecting my heart. And there is no reason from the outside and looking at my situation that I should have peace, but for some reason I am at peace. Where does that come from? You tap into that peace through prayer, through prayer. And so here is Peter, surrounded by soldiers and yet he has a tremendous peace. But this prayer of the church also brought illumination. Notice verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. It was illuminated. And he struck Peter, notice this, on the side and raised him up saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Whether this was the light of the angel's presence or another miraculous manifestation of light, in the darkness of that prison cell, light was revealed. You know, the Bible does tell us that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. The Bible exhorts us to walk in the light as He is in the light, and we will have fellowship with one another. Peter was in a place where he did not know what to do, what was going to happen to him, but prayer provided the answers that he needed. Light illuminated into that darkness. Light comes into this impossibility, and suddenly things are starting to take place. I do believe and, and, and have experienced that when we pray, that God works. And it's difficult sometimes because when we pray, we don't necessarily see God working. And we have to pray in faith, believing that He's working even though we can't see it. And there have been times when I have prayed and sought the Lord and I didn't see anything happening. Maybe you're in your prayer closet. It's not like you can physically see something happening, but in, in the spiritual realm, something is taking place. Our prayers aren't hindered. They can go to other countries, other continents, other places. I mean, I mean, there is such power in prayer, I think, so often that we don't realize. But isn't it a blessing when you're praying and you're asking God for wisdom and suddenly a day goes by or two days or a week and suddenly there it is. God starts to give you direction as to what you're supposed to do. He brings light into a darkened situation. He brings light into an impossibility. And so as the church continued to pray, we also find that Peter's chains fell from his hands. I love that. Peter was bound with no hope of ever being free, and yet it says his chains fell off. How? Somebody was praying for him. Somebody was praying and his chains fell off. Do you have loved ones who are bound in sin? Do you have those that you have no access? They don't want to talk to you. Don't ever call me again. Don't ever, I don't want to see your face. And you know what? You're not going to see your grandkids either. Don't ever do, I mean, those kinds of things are so painful. What do you do? I can't. We were asked a question today. What about this situation? What do we do? You pray. You pray. And God has ways 
of going into darkened places and opening eyes and breaking chains. I don't know how he does it. He just does it because he's God. And here his chains fell off. And suddenly, you find that it was a powerful experience that happens. You know, you ever heard of the guy George Mueller? Uh, maybe you've read his autobiography. It's powerful. Ran an um, orphanage for children. George Mueller was a prayer warrior. He, he trusted God with everything. And he was a man known for persistence in prayer. And the story is told that one day, I remember reading it, that George Mueller began praying for five of his friends. And after many months, one of them came to the Lord. Ten years later, two others were converted. It took 25 years of prayer for the, for the fourth man to come to Christ. And then after his death, it had been 52 years of intercession for this last friend that he'd been praying for. His faith was rewarded because soon after Mueller's uh, memorial, his friend came to Christ. 52 years of praying for one guy and God came through. Don't stop praying. Who are you praying for right now? What are you asking God to do? What are you petitioning God for in your church? What, what are the things that you were praying about and you just quit praying about it? You know, either, when you pray, God either says yes, he says no, or he says wait. Keep on praying. What if Elijah would have stopped praying about the fifth time when he went up looking for rain? He said to his servant, hey, do you see anything? I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Go again. Five times, six times. What if on the sixth time he said, all right, that's it. Forget it. The seventh time he said, go and look. Do you see anything? I'm sure the servant was like, Elijah, buddy, come on. I mean, give me a break. This is seven times. He comes back and says, you know something? I saw something. I saw a cloud the size of a man's fist in the distance. Elijah said, that's it. That's it. That's all I needed. You better get down this hill. It's about to pour. I mean, just having that kind of, and he was a man of like passions, and yet he prayed and it rained. He prayed and it didn't rain. I mean, that, that's what God wants from us. And it's the same God that hears us that hurt Elijah. So what are we praying for? What are we persistently petitioning God for? It brought illumination, but this prayer also brought peace, and it also provided direction. Look at verse 8. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie your sandals on. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him. And he didn't know what was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own accord. And they went out and went down the street. And immediately the angel departed from him. Verse 11. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Oh, now, now you know. Peter did not understand what was happening. He didn't know the believers were praying for him. He thought he was seeing another vision like he did at Simon the Tanner's house a few chapters earlier. But when the angel arrived in the prison cell, he began providing Peter with directions to follow. And some of them, they're very practical. The first one, get dressed and put your shoes on. Let's just start there. Our God is a very practical God. It's just, just what can you do? I don't know about this. Hey, put your shoes on and let's go. Get dressed and let's just start with that. Just start there. It's just the simple things. Then Peter was being led led through closed doors that began to open on their own. The first door opens, and then the massive iron door, like a garage door, just, just opens up on its own accord. And Peter comes out into this. He didn't have to kick it down. He didn't have to climb over it. He didn't have to go under it. The Lord supernaturally opened the doors that were closed. How? Through prayer, through intercession, you know, the Bible tells us about our Lord in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7 that He opens and no one shuts and He shuts and no one can open. God has ways of opening doors that we can't. I could go on and on about the doors that God has opened through the years and I'm sure you have your testimonies too. When it seemed like the door was shut and there's no way in and for some reason the Lord just opened it miraculously. You didn't, you didn't huff and puff and blow it down. You didn't kick it in. God just opened it. He made a way when there wasn't one. That's what God does. He's the master of breakthrough, David called him. He has ways of opening doors that nobody else can. He, and the key to opening those doors is petitioning God in prayer. Lord, if you shut this door, then you probably have another door you want me to walk through. I'm sure that many of us could testify today that there were doors that we were about to go through and God said, that's not the one. And we thought, 
Why did you close that door? Why would you not allow me to go through this? This is such a great opportunity for you, God, and for me. I mean, you, 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 why didn't you open it? Because God had you want, he wanted you to walk through this one over here. So he purposely shut this one. He shut that one to get you to go through this one. God does that. And I'm so glad that he does. I, I look back and I think, you know what, Lord? Those doors that I banged on and pleaded with you, come on, God, open this up. Come on. And you, you wouldn't. I was so upset. And then I got down the road a few years and thought, thank you, Jesus. You didn't answer that prayer. You didn't open that door. I think there's going to be a lot of prayers when we get to heaven that we realize, you know what, God? Thank you. And some of it, you don't even have to get to heaven. You can just go to your class reunion. And uh, you just realize, <laughs> Jesus, hallelujah, I didn't end up with, mm, you know. And they might be saying that when they see you as well. But nonetheless, you realize, he's praise God. He has ways. He knows what he's doing. He opens door. Jesus is the door. He is the door. Well, then after this prison break, Peter decides to visit the people who were praying for him. And so notice verse 13. This is great. We're almost through. Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced Peter stood before the gate. And they said to her, you are beside yourself. It's like saying, you're nuts. You've lost it, Rhoda. You're crazy. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. And they said, it's an angel. I mean, okay, if it's an angel, wouldn't you still want to go check it out? Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. The, the prayer meeting for Peter's release was held at a, a home of a woman named Mary, who was the sister of Barnabas, who was the mother of John Mark. When Peter comes to the door, he knocks, and the maidservant answers. And, and she was so shocked that she saw Peter at the door, she just, she just walked away. She shut the door in his face and, and went and told everybody, hey, everybody, hey, hey, Peter's outside. You can imagine the church, they're like, Lord, just let Peter, Lord, just, let's, just free him, Lord, whatever it takes, just do it. Hey, Peter's here. They're like, be quiet. We're praying for Peter's release. Lord, we just pray. You know, no, I'm serious. It's him. You are a crazy woman. It's an angel. You know, Lord, we just, and finally they hear Peter banging on the door. I'm going to tell you something. This blesses me. This is the early church, and even the early church struggled in their prayer meetings. I mean, even they, they were, when Peter showed up, they were, they were surprised that God answered their prayers. Have you ever been surprised when God answered your prayers? Like, why do we doubt? Why do we doubt? I don't know why I do that. I have this history with God that can tell me, God, you do the impossible. Nothing is too hard for you. Why do I doubt? I, and I've, I've learned that it's not so much that I doubt God, I doubt me, whether I'm actually hearing from God. Did I really hear from the Lord on this? Is this really the Lord? Is this the door you're opening, or is this just me trying to open a door? And, and you, you battle with that. You go back and forth, and the enemy's right there. You've never heard from the Lord. God doesn't speak to you. He speaks to other people. Yeah, that's probably true. And you're fighting it, and then God answers your prayer, and you're surprised. Why are you surprised? It's what you've been praying for. You ask God to open the door. Well, that probably couldn't be the Lord opening the door. Hey, why? You prayed for it, and he did it. Some prayers take a long time. <laughs> they take a long time before God answers. But this encourages me tremendously. Because sometimes I feel like when I pray, maybe I don't have all the faith that I need. You need to have faith when you're going to pray. You need, you need to pray with faith, and we do. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anybody that comes to God must believe that He exists, and He's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek Him. I get it. Hebrews tells us that. But sometimes I feel, Lord, my faith is, is I trust you, but I'm, I'm struggling. And, I, and I've learned that, that God is, is faithful, even when I'm faithless. That He cannot deny Himself, and He answers because He's good. Not because I'm such a powerful prayer warrior, but because he's faithful and he knows my heart. We also find that prayer overcomes opposition. We find out in verse 17, when Herod found out Peter had escaped and put the soldiers to death, he went down to Caesarea, and it says he stayed there. 
He stayed there. And verse 20, And Herod had been angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because of their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Her- Herod's in a rage. He's so upset that Peter got away. He's upset. He goes down to Caesarea, and he's there. And verse 21 tells us, On a set day, Herod comes out. He's arrayed in his royal apparel. He sat on his throne, and he gave an oration to them. Josephus, who was a secular historian, talks about the royal apparel of Herod on this particular day, Herod Agrippa I. He said that he sat there in a silver threaded attire in the sense that the rays of the sun fell upon the robe and they made it glitter. You've seen a lot of this in, in Reno, no doubt, you know, in Vegas, a lot of glittering. And it's just, it was shining off the sun and it dazzled everybody. And, and Herod now is about to give this political speech and everybody is just amazed. And it says the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately an angel struck him because he didn't give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. End of story. I mean, there's just power in prayer. I mean, just the guy's out there, the voice, he doesn't give glory to God and just, the Lord says, all right, there's a lesson in that. Always give glory to God. Nobody wants to die being eaten by worms. I mean, that is just not a good way to go. Uh, but Herod's clothes are shining, his head was swelling, and the people were shouting. And he just soaked it all in, and then he died. John Stott commented on the 12th chapter of Acts, and this is what he said. He said, the, chapter of, the 12th chapter of Acts opens, James is killed, Peter's in prison, Herod is triumphing. By the end of the chapter, Herod is dead, Peter is free, and the word of God is triumphing. I mean, just, it, God, what I, what I want to impart to you, this is what I want you to understand. This is my main point here, all right? The God we serve can do anything. It, it, impossibility is not something for God. He is the God of the impossible. God can turn things around. He, he can take an impossible situation and, and he can make it possible. God can. It was Alan Redpath that said, let's keep our chins up and our knees down. We're on the side of victory for Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. You know, I close with this. In Jeremiah chapter 32, you may recall that the prophet Jeremiah was in prison. The city of Jerusalem was being overrun with the Babylonians. And the nation of Israel was being carried away into captivity. Things looked completely hopeless. The nation was, it just it's over. It's over. There is no hope. We are done. In the midst of all that, the Lord asked Jeremiah to do something that was unthinkable given the present circumstances. Jeremiah was told to purchase land that was presently being taken over by the Babylonians which would serve as a demonstration of the faith that the land would eventually be given to the Jews once their 70 years of captivity was completed. And to Jeremiah, this just seemed so strange. But Jeremiah knew what it was to hear from God. And as the conversation with the Lord progresses, the Lord asked Jeremiah a question. And I've asked myself this question many times. The Lord said to him, Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? God asked Jeremiah that question. Is there anything too hard for me, Jeremiah? Yes, for you, obviously. But for me? And this was Jeremiah's response. He said, Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing nothing too hard for you. You know, it's amazing to me, folks, as we being here together and and again, looking at all of the displays that are out there and all of the, the chronicled history over the last 25 years. Do you know so many, almost all of those things, all of those pictures that we see, those were impossibilities that God made possible. We have a catalog of the faithfulness of God. We can look at those stories and we can see those images and those were impossibilities that God made possible. He's the same God. So let me ask you, what is standing in front of you today that's impossible? What what is it just that there's just no way? For who? Who's in charge? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That is the question. May we respond like Jeremiah and say, 
Oh, Lord God, there is nothing too hard for you. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today that no matter what impossibility we face, you're the God of the impossible. Nothing is too hard for you. Oh, Lord, increase our faith that we might trust you for greater things to come. Help us not to limit you in any way, but to pray big prayers because we serve a great God. In Jesus' name.